Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it looks like the Calgary Flames season might be turning around and the sky might no longer be falling. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt here to break down the week for you. Matt, overall, good week for the Flames, I'd say. What about you? Well, not the best start to the week, but it certainly looks like it's turning around slowly as the week's gone on. You don't feel like we need to move all the players anymore? Uh, uh, still waiting and seeing, but, you know, one half of one good game and a lucky win against Philadelphia doesn't really impress me much. You know, we'll, we'll have to see how they go on uh, over the next couple of weeks. Well, let's break down this past week. On uh, November 19th, the Calgary Flames played the Colorado Avalanche here in the Sal Dome. They came back for that game um, from their busy road schedule they've been on. Few lineup changes here, mostly on the defensive side with uh, Brody out, Hamannick out, and Bennett out. The big changes that we saw were the first line in this game for the forwards was Johnny Goudreau, Michael Backlund, and Elias Lindholm. The second line, Monjapani, Monahan, and Kachuk. Um, and then on the defensive side, we had Giordano and Anderson, Hannafin and Stone, and Shillington and Brandon Davidson slotted in. So. Um, either way, it didn't change the Flames' fortunes. They lost 3-2 to two to the Avalanche here, getting goals from Derek Ryan and Andrew Mangiapane. Thoughts on this one, Matt? Well, it's basically been a typical Flames game where they play very poorly. Then when they get down 3 nothing, they decide, oh, we actually have to play hockey now. And then, you know, they nearly made it back, but they ran out of time. Zach Ronaldo got his uh, first game as a flame in this one, and I thought for the 6.5 minutes that he played, he did his job well. Uh, he was on a line with Froelich and Jankowski. It's nice to have those guys you can call up and you know have them sort of already ready for the NHL level. And if you only need six and a half minutes, why not bring Ronaldo up? Yep. Uh, it's just like when Peluso played for us last year, and it wasn't memorable, any of those games, but he did his job and didn't embarrass himself, so that's the important thing. So, I'll have you guess on this one. Before the Derek Ryan goal, how many shots do you think the Flames had taken since their last goal? Oh, it has to be in the hundreds. Uh, about 140, I'd say. 96. Oh, uh, okay. Close that's enough. That's sh Ashley's shots, on, shots that are counted on net. You and I have said sometimes, hmm, who's counting shots on net here? Yeah. How many times have we gone and seen three rebounds and it counts as one shot? True enough. So, um, on paper coming into this one, I really like the idea of the Johnny Goudreau, Michael Backlund, Elias Lindholm pairing. I found, though, it didn't play out too well during the game. As much as we're trying to shake the lineup up right now, I think that um, Johnny, you, you've either kind of got to go Johnny and Monty together or... Monahan Kachuk, which they tried, but somebody stronger than Lindholm or than Mon than Monjapani with those guys. I think really, if they want to shake this up, they really need to do uh, Monahan Kachuk and Lindholm together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's hard when you have uh, injuries and players that are struggling where it, you can't have like another quality second line player to throw in the mix to do a proper blending of the lines. I think, you know, looking back at this, I'm just reading my notes here. The flames got hemmed in their own zone far too much, which is always a recipe for disaster, especially against a team like Colorado. And, you know, for when you look at it, we really had half a, an NHL defensive uh, core here with, I'd say Giordano, Anderson, Hannafin really being the only proven NHLers. So with three, you know, only three or six NHLers really being guys that are, probably NHL mainstays at this point in their career. 3-2 is not a bad final score. No, but the team itself was flat again, and they didn't show up to play until it was already 3 nothing. And to their credit, they nearly came back. But like, I don't understand why this team continually just lets the game go away and then oh we have to play now and if they actually showed up 
right from the opening whistle, at, then the Flames probably have eight or nine more points in the standings. But they just, like, they do lead the league in uh, comebacks in the last five minutes of games with seven. It's just frustrating when you can see, like, when they are down like that, that they have the talent and the drive to come back. But, like, why aren't you doing that? right from opening puck drop and like that's why this team's so frustrating because the talent is there it's just that they can't seem to get out of their own way yeah that's that sounds like a good way of putting it um well let's look at the next game here the calgary flames went on the road again doesn't seem like they're always on the road so far in the season I know. It's been a weird one. I th- there was a graphic in the Pittsburgh game where they've done uh, 47,000 kilometers already, which is more than the circumference of the Earth, even. Wow. S- and, like, that's ridiculous, but... Well, in December, they're mostly at home, so that'll hopefully help, uh, you know, help them get back in a rhythm. But let's not worry about that yet. Let's go to the next game. The Calgary Flames went to St. Louis, where they took on the defending Stanley Cup St. Louis Blues. And not a good game for the Flames at all. Jordan Bennington re- recorded a 40-save shutout. Um, and Zach Sanford got four points to propel their team to a 5 nothing lo- uh, win over the Flames. I thought this one, if you wanted to talk about teams falling apart, that's exactly what we saw here. Yeah, uh, I think the Flames had maybe two quality scoring chances in the entire game. And... Yeah, this was... Uh, honestly, I think the Calgary Hitmen would have played better. Well, and like, this this game looked to me sort of like what you were talking about earlier, where the Flames didn't show up to play, but by the time it was time to get going late in the game, they just couldn't get it going. No, and to uh, St. Louis's credit, they just put the boot down on the Flames and... Yeah, it, this was just an embarrassingly bad game. And, like, there's no positives to draw from this one at all, other than Riddick played well, which, you know... But it's, that's been the story of every game. I know, but it's scary when a 5 nothing loss, the goalie played well. You know, like, it, it easily could have been double digits if he was having an off night. Yeah, it just it just an embarrassingly bad game. It, in fact, this I'd have to go back to like the 2013-2014 season right at the end when guys like Kenny Augustino were on the team to recall a game that was just that bad by the Flames. <laughs> like it, it, yeah, it was painful to watch that one. I think you and I kind of both expected expected this would be a rough game for the team, but I didn't expect it to be that rough. No, like I was expecting a loss, but, you know, th- that wasn't just a loss. That was a complete and utter de- destruction of the team in that one. I guess the good that came out of this was after the game, the Calgary Flames players had a closed-door meeting in their dressing room. We don't really know what was said. The players are keeping it tight-lipped. And then uh, their plane was late leaving St. Louis, so they actually left the following morning. So um, if you read sort of what the players have talked about and what the media has talked about, um, there was more discussion from the players at the, at the hotel afterwards. So, you know, every cloud has silver lining, and maybe that's silver lining on this one. Yeah. I'm surprised, honestly, it's taken this long for the team to have that kind of a meeting, though. It's it's past due, and I think everyone's frustrated, but it looks like maybe it paid off because the Calgary Flames came out on Saturday the 23rd to play their 11 a.m. Mountain Time game and ended up winning a 3-2 to two shootout win over the Philadelphia Flyers. We had Andrew Mangiapane scores fifth and Elias Lindholm scores 11th. And then it was Matthew Kachuk in the shootout that ended up putting this game away for the Flames. And you know what? Probably not the best game for the team, but at this point, you got to take the two points however you can get them. Yeah, this honestly, I view this game as as bad for the Flames as the St. Louis game. And they just lucked their way into two points. Yeah, uh, David Riddick was the only reason why it wasn't like six or seven 
nothing after two periods and like that second period was awful by the flames i think they only had two shots in the entire period and they came very close to giving yet another one away and if it wasn't for a nice shot by Manjapani and a good bounce off the boards on the Anderson shot to Lindholm like we're talking about now an eight game losing streak and you know it, this team like it, they really need to get their stuff together well they were 0-5 and 1 coming into this so that's six games so either way whether it was good or bad it came to an end and I think that just that streak coming to an end really propelled this team as we saw tonight in Pittsburgh um Big news going into this game in Pittsburgh. TJ Brody activated off the IR back in the lineup, and you could definitely tell that our defense had been missing him. Matt, when was the last time you can remember the Flames opening the scoring this season? Uh, it feels like you have to go back to last season, frankly. And for them to score a goal in the first period, you know, I think that's only the 11th goal they've had in the first period this season. Mm -hmm. Like, Dylan Dubé's in the lineup. He was probably brought in to bring some youth and energy, and he got his first goal of the year assisted from Anderson and Ryan at 734 in the first. So, yeah, the Flames starting early. I thought they had a great start to this game. Um, they finally opened the scoring. Overall, I think even though the Flames you know, didn't get the win in this one, they came away with one point. I think this is a really good game for them to build on. Yeah, the first period and... Frankly, the second period was, even though they didn't have as many shots as the Penguins, they still were right there with them, which most times the second period is the Flames' worst period. Just like the Philadelphia game where like they only had two shots, that's basically been most of the Flames' second periods this season where it's just like, what are you doing? Uh, this time they actually looked like an NHL team for the first 40 minutes, and then they didn't really have much compete in the third, but in overtime, it could have very well been a Flames win, but bounces go the other way, and, you know, they didn't get the win. They This is the only game that they actually deserved to win, and they lost, <laughs> which, you know, that's the way hockey goes sometimes. The thing I really liked about the team in this game, if I, t if I look back at it, is I felt like every time Pittsburgh started to push back at the flames they were there to answer and so often we've seen in the past that the opposing team has started to push and started to push and the flames just say okay you can have the game and i thought even though the flames weren't in control or weren't maybe playing their best game the entire night i thought there was a lot of uh, good that we saw just in terms of the game flow on this one yeah and it looked more like what we saw when the flames were decent last year this might be the close thing to a 60-minute effort we've seen this season. Yeah, I'd agree with that. And if the Flames can keep going with this, I won't have any worries about the team and the season. Like, they'll rebound, and you'll see them slowly climb the standings over a few weeks if that's what we're going to get from this team. On the other hand, if they revert, you know, because they didn't get rewarded with the extra point. If they revert back to anything that we saw before that game, then, yeah, it's not going to be good. No, and I think this is a game that, you know, on their way to Buffalo, they can watch some video and hopefully build on. And I think that getting TJ Brody back in the lineup was probably a boost for these guys. But this game is really what we need to see them playing from here on out if they want to have any chance of success this season. Yeah, and we'll see how things go. But, you know, on the overall this week, I am was not at all impressed with how this week went. But at least there's a glimmer of hope for positive change, which that's something that we didn't have at this point last week. And... You know, hopefully they have a you know they have a little bit of an easier time with Buffalo, Ottawa, and Buffalo. I do believe this week, so it should hopefully be a little easier uh, in terms of the quality of opponents to get on a roll. 
But you know, you know what though? The best teams in the league aren't always the ones that play the best, but the ones that find a way to win. And I'm not saying the Flames are the best out there, but while that Philadelphia game may not have been great, they found a way to win. And I think that if they're going to get back to being the number one team in the West, that's going to be important. You can't play every game all out. No team does that. But just finding those ways to win is going to be important. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, I guess the biggest question of the week, uh, talking now we've talked about the Flames week, was the firing of Mike Babcock. I don't think there was a bigger story in hockey this week than the firing of Mike Babcock. And we all know that uh, the Flames have been struggling, just like Toronto has. So I guess the big question, and I've heard a lot of Flames fans ask this since then, should Bill Peters be next? And if so, who should replace him? What are your thoughts? Well, I think that if the Flames continue to struggle over the next week or two, then I would not be surprised if Bill Peters gets fired. Um, And especially with certain things that came up today that we're not going to go into with the Kima Lou, especially if that actually is true, then yeah, definitely he should go. We're just going to wait for the Calgary Flames to make their comment before we comment on that. Yeah, um, but um, it, yeah, it, it just depends on er- how everything goes. But um, yeah, it's he. The Flames have been a better, bitter, bitter disappointment, and uh, Peters and Babcock both are the same mentality of coach. So uh, it, you know, and the issues that have plagued the Leafs have plagued the Flames. So I could see the Flames be next to make a change, and I, I would, as for who would replace them, honestly, I have no idea, because there's not really any, because the Flames made changes in their internal system, it's not like uh, Toronto where they had Sheldon Keefe, who was looking good in uh, the farm, ready to go, I I guess, like, as a temp, you could throw Huska in there. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't really know who would be an upgrade on Huska, even. So I'd be a little leery on, like, it. it's a little bit more of a tougher to, uh, thing because it's not clear right now. And I think, to me, that's one of the biggest questions in my mind is if we make the coaching change who do we go to if you're firing the co- the coach to try and turn the team around to me huska is not going to turn the team around huska is the guy to keep the seat warm until the end of the year and as you mentioned last week if the flames sort of give up on the season and say okay let's you know move some assets and retool then maybe huska is the guy but if you're trying to fire them to get them motivated i don't know who you replace them with yeah because like last year the blues brought barube out of you know, off the sidelines, he wasn't a part of their team, and he ended up doing well. And I don't know, like, if there's any good young coaches or anything like that that are available. It's just, yeah, if the Flames do need to make a change, it'll be interesting to see who they go with. It's and just... after firing a coach like um, Bill Peters, you generally see them bring in a players' coach. Right? That's kind yeah. of the way that the ebb and flow works. And I don't know what players, coaches are out there that aren't just, oh, this guy's the next AHL guy who's you know available. Like, I don't want to just get someone's leftovers. Yeah. Like, it, uh, Bruce Boudreaux might be a decent option if he's available. I don't. I think he's with Minnesota still, though, isn't he not? I think so. We had a few people who uh, emailed us and said, would you swap coaches, essentially? Would you see the Flames hiring Babcock in Toronto, hiring um, Peters? And to me, there's, I mean, Peters was sort of groomed in the Mike Mike Babcock school of coaching. You're not going to move one for the other. Why even fire a coach then? Yeah. They're too similar, I think, in their styles and the way they work. And I think if, if your players have tuned out um, Peters, there's there's no way they're going to let Babcock in or vice versa. If your guys have tuned out Peters, there's no way they're going to work for Babcock. Yeah. it's it, Yeah, it's going to be exactly the same person, basically, in which case, like, why? what's the point? 
The only hesitancy I have at this point to give her the coach, besides, as we talked about the fact, I don't know who fills the role, is we've gone through way too many coaches. I mean, if you take a look, Bob Hartley was here from 2012, 2016, then Gullitson 2016 and 2018, then Peters 2018 till now. And it just feels like we've gone through the coach has been the scapegoat every time we have made the playoffs pretty much. And I don't know at this point that it's a coaching issue. I mean, yeah, they might need to change the coach because it's easy and it's the, you know, the easy thing to do and the thing that, you know, they can do reactionary. But at this point, after three coaches with essentially the same core, I don't think it's coaching. No, I agree. And like, that's why like last week I was mentioning making changes to the team instead of like, Oh, just fire the coach. Cause intrinsically, you know, we've gone through how many coaches now and, you know, there hasn't been any real accountability on the players. And it's one of those where, yeah, it's really tough because you can't really, like, make a trade. It's not like before where, like, you'd get two teams who are struggling who would swap players to try and shake things up back in like the early 90s and such and like now like there's the only semi-decent player that i could see being traded from any team is kyle turris and you know that that wouldn't really even be much of an upgrade on lou cheech at this point so it yeah like there's not really anything that the flames can do to immediately fix the team um, if I let me ask you this question since 2000 it's now 2019 what do you think would be a reasonable number of coaches for a team to go through um if you're a winning team at the top of their game probably you'd go through like a coach every four or five years like if you're one of the better teams like how many how do- the flames have gone through since 2000 oh god uh has to be well use your fingers i I think 11 12 something like that don hay greg gilbert al mcneil daryl sutter jim playfair mike keenan brent sutter bob hartley gullitson and peters that's what eight coaches uh 10 10 oh yeah okay take mcneil out because he was interim but yeah so like nine guys in nine in 19 years so they're we're averaging what two and a half years a coach yeah rough math in my head yeah basically one every other year so i'm i just i understand where fans are coming from that oh the coach is ineffective but i i don't know who else you bring in i think like you said Huska would end up getting the job in the meantime actually i think they would probably give it to uh jeff ward because he's the associate coach so yeah. But again, I don't know Jeff Ward is any any better or different. He's a guy that keeps the seat warm until we find, you know, the next coach. And if you look at the Flames, outside of Glenn Gulletson, they've kind of gone with the old NHL standbys. Keenan, Sutter, Sutter, um, Hartley. They tried Playfair. They tried Gulletson. Neither of their upcoming coaches panned out, which tells me they'd probably go with another you know, like you said, a Boudreaux type, and I'm not sure that's any better. To me, I like um, Bill Peters as a coach. I think he's the right coach for this team, and I think that we would regret firing him when this team gets good. Yeah. It's just tough right now, and, like, this team seems to have, like, foundational issues that are preventing them from playing the way they should, and... I'm hoping that with their play against Pittsburgh that we're going to see more of that moving forward, but it's hard to tell. Right now, the Flames are fifth in the Pacific Division at 26 points, tied with Vegas. Um, We have Vancouver ahead of us at 28 points, Arizona 31, and Edmonton 35. And Calgary's record now is 11, 12, and 4. Matt, you were mentioned earlier the only good player you could see getting traded is um, Kyle Turris. And I've been thinking about this since last week when you were talking about potentially, you know, who could you move, who could you change, how could you retool the team, and who could be trade partners. And I think right now if you want to make a hockey trade, your best partner 
would probably be the Buffalo Sabres, who I think are also struggling and looking to make a move. Yeah, I could see that. I've always liked you know, Rasmus Rustalainen, but I don't think that they're going to move him. I think that they kind of didn't develop him properly as a defenseman, but he's still a good offensive player and might be a cheap-ish acquisition. To... I think I think Rustalainen they're going to want a lot for. Yeah, I think it'd be worth it though, but it would depend. Uh, like like everything, the acquisition cost is what matters. I'm just looking at their roster, and I think that when we um, when we look down the roster, they're a team that's struggling, and they're a team that might want to make some moves, and um, not necessarily that are going to help us or be the best player we can find, but you know, guys that are are good enough, I guess, to, you know, to swap one of our guys for. Not that I necessarily think he'll help us a lot, but I could see the Flames going after Shiri. Um, yeah, that would be an uh, adequate depth guy. Yeah, I think he's an NHL caliber guy. I think that his contract's decent enough that I could see the Flames making a run at him. Yeah. Um, I don't know where he... Oh, let me see here. Um, oh, he's on IR. I was going to say, I could also see the Flames because the right winger, even though he's older, I could see the Flames if he wasn't on IR taking a swing at Kyle Ocposo. Yeah. Again, Not that, that I, would be an adequate-ish... Yeah, you know. but I think if they're just thinking they need to make some moves, that um, Buffalo might be a team that w just wants to make some moves with you. Not yeah. necessarily give each other your best player or something like that, but hey, we'll give you this guy, you give us that guy. I'm thinking like a Shiri and for, you know, like a fro leak and a pick type move just to move some players around. Yeah, I could see that. Um, you know, I don't think they're going to move Middlestad or Olafson, Eichel, Reinhardt, Skinner. We've talked about Reinhardt before, but. You know, we don't want Lazar back. I think Vessi's overpaid. They've got some decent defensemen, potentially, but on the forward side, which is where I think the Flames would deal from. Um, I, I, I just I think that there are two teams that might just need a shake-up. Yeah, I agree with you there. And, you know, frankly, like the Flames, if they're not turning it around soon, like they've played three to five games more than everybody below them in the standings. And, you know, it if they don't start winning soon like we're gonna be down with like la and detroit as like the worst teams in the nhl you know they're deceptively high in the standings like they're only two points out of a wild card spot right now uh but it's or yeah they're tied for a wild card spot pardon me but it's one of those where you know if they don't get going soon they could fall very far, very fast. I hate to say it, and I don't want to wait that long, but I think the best thing for this team is going to be to come home. Yeah, true enough. We we come home on Saturday, then we have four days off. They have the first, second, the third, and the fourth. I think just resting after all their road trips is going to be helpful, and then they have Buffalo, L.A. at home. Um, they have a quick two-game road trip, Colorado, Arizona, and then they're back for four games after that. Like I think just coming home and having some rest might turn this team around. Oh, well, you have to hope that something does. And even know. the road trips in December. I mean, we're going Colorado, Arizona, Dallas, Minnesota, and Edmonton. They're not bad trips. Most of those, you could be back home that night if you wanted to. Yeah. Well, Matt, I had another question I wanted to ask you this week. Uh, not so much about blowing up the team, but looking at an honest assessment of the parts on this team. And the guy that I wanted to chat with you about was David Riddick. Um, the Calgary Flames so far this year have played uh, 27 games, and David Riddick has started 20 of those games so far. He has 10 wins, 7 losses, 3 overtime losses. A couple questions I had for you. First off, do you think they're relying on Riddick too much right now? No, it's one of those things that, frankly... This is sort of like when Cam Talbot was the goalie on the Oilers, that, frankly, they need to start Riddick to have any shot to win. Because, like, this... And that's not a slight to Talbot. Like, he's actually been fairly good in his own right, but the team just doesn't show up when Talbot starts. And they need to do something to get points. And Riddick is getting used way too much right now. I think he should be around 16 games instead of 
20, but, you know, if the Flames were doing better, I think things would be split a little bit more evenly. But that's it. Do you think they're kind of riding them too hard, and do you think we'll regret it down the road when maybe we're, you know, making the playoffs or pushing for the playoffs, and he's not ready to go? Yeah, I think they will. Um, If things don't change soon... Uh, then like if the, the flames are basically using him that much all season he's going to be burnt by the playoffs and because he's just not used to starting that much and you know unless the flames start banking a, a bunch of points in the near future where they can actually get a cushion in the standings where they don't have to worry about you know falling to the basement then they can start using Talbot more, and maybe Talbot can go on a little bit of a run to give Riddick some time off. But until that happens, the Flames are basically stuck riding with Riddick, and to even give them a chance this season. And, you know, it's frustrating because this team, I don't think, would have wanted to use Riddick as much as they have. It's just that they've had no other option. I think they went into this year wanting to sort of run a 50-50 rotation until the new year. That's kind of the sense I was getting. See who did well and then give that guy more time. Yeah. Or even a 60-40 with Riddick being the number one, but, you know, not, you know, like 70-30. So, you know, and that's my worry here is, okay, so if the Flames do turn this around and end up making the playoffs and our number one goalie is spent – I guess what good is that? Like it's at one point we've given Riddick seven starts so far, or sorry, we've given Talbot seven starts. I don't think he's looked bad in any of them. It's just the team in front of him isn't looking good. And at what point do you say, well, the team's not really showing up for either guy. Let's just start using the other guy. We can't do any worse. Can we? Well, I think that if the flames continue to waffle for the next couple weeks, where basically the season's over at that point, like if uh, they they haven't rebounded by the middle of December, to me the season's done. And like if that's the case, then just rotate them fifty fifty. Who cares? You know, as if the team's not going to show up, that doesn't really matter. So just you know, who cares? Well, and and if the season is out of reach by then, I mean, Riddick's on a a one year deal. At some point, you even say, you know what? There's a tradable asset to make some tweaks, and let's just bring John Gillies in. Yeah, well, if uh, at the deadline, if the Flames are out of it, I expect Talbot to be gone. And That's I, what I meant, sorry, Talbot. Yeah, yeah, it's on a one-year. And, you know, and that would make perfect sense. Like, it would be stupid, frankly, for the Flames to keep Talbot if they're selling at the deadline uh, just because you're just wasting an asset that, you know, you could get a third or second round pick for Talbot. So, you know, hey, great. You know, it's something. And... You know, it, we do have a dearth of good young goaltenders in Stockton. Uh, you can give Gillies, Parsons. Um, I can't remember the other guy's I, name. I want to keep Zega Doolin down there just because I think go. that he, he needs the AHL time. Yeah, I might give Zega Doolin a game or two towards the end of the season just to, you know, like this is the NHL. Um, but, yeah, like it, it's... Going back to David Riddick, do you really think that David Riddick, if we want to be a Stanley Cup team, is the goalie you ride to the Stanley Cup? Or do you think he's just an adequate, um, you know, goalie in that role? And I I say this, and I'm going to get a lot of hate probably for saying this. I think Jordan Binnington, for example, isn't a great goaltender. I think he's an adequate goaltender in front of a good or behind a good defense. Yeah. And Binnington, I think, is an a slightly above average starter in the NHL. He reminds me of Tim Thomas that way. I never thought Tim Thomas was a great goalie. I thought that he was a, you know, a good enough goalie with a good defense in front of him. Yeah. Well, when Thomas was good, like he could play like at a level like Kipper did when Kipper was on his game. Like he could, like, especially in the Stanley cup finals against Vancouver, Thomas was just awesome in that series and was the only reason really that they won. But Bennington, he's an above-average guy. And Riddick, I think, is an above-average guy. I don't think Riddick is one of the top goalies in the NHL, and I don't think he'll ever be one of the top goalies in the NHL. But he's not bad. And, 
you know, like there, there have been guys that have won the Stanley Cup where they're a bad goaltender, uh, namely Antti Niemi. Like he was terrible when Chicago won the Cup and the Blackhawks won in spite of him. But you know, usually most of the guys that win the Cup, they just have to be okay or better. Like and, I guess even on this team, when I look back. Mika Kiprasov was stealing us games, and I'm not seeing that from David Riddick regularly. Maybe one or two he's stolen us since he's been here. I don't think there's a goalie that wins for you. I think he's a goalie that has to be part of a winning team. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. He's not Carey Price. Or to go back in time, like Dominic Hasek or Patrick Waugh. Like that 93 Stanley Cup final, or Stanley Cup, playoffs for Patrick Waugh like it was pretty much him versus the other team and Waugh just would will his team to win it pretty much did everything single-handedly and I don't see uh anything like that in Riddick and I you know the most goalies like I, I, there's maybe two guys in the NHL right now that I could see that level of upper end play like Kipper could and, yeah, we just don't have that. And most teams don't have that. And I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, we're obviously not going to make a change this year. But going two, three, four years down the road, do you still see David Riddick as our good enough starter? Or do you think that, you know, Tree Living really has to be on the lookout saying, is there somebody better than this? Or do you think he's kind of the guy until one of the younger goalies in the system supplants him? Well, for me, uh, like, I've always been of the mind that you just keep cycling goaltenders through your system until you get the equivalent of a Kiprasov and, uh, or something but like... But the system and at the end. NHL level are two different things. Yeah, you know what I mean, though. Like, organizationally, you just keep cycling guys through. And, like, we've seen that since Kippers left. Like, how many guys have they tried? And Riddick has been the best of the bunch, and I think he'll continue to be good enough for a while. But it's just like when uh, Anaheim had uh, Frederick Anderson. He was good enough and a very good goaltender, but then Gibson was better, and that allowed them to move on from Anderson. And I think that Riddick can hold the fort until we get that something better. Whether that's a guy like Zagadulin or Parsons or Gillies or whomever, that doesn't matter. We just have to keep cycling the second guy on the team through until we find the true number one and, you know, whenever that comes. And, I mean, you know, Riddick is definitely looking good this year for a guy who's a first-time starter. He's definitely, I think, worth his more than the $2.75 million we're paying him this year and next year. When he's up for a raise, I think, like you said, he's good enough. But I think there's a lot of guys like that around the league. And I'm thinking, you know what? Maybe you sign him to one more after this. But I'm not expecting this to be a, a career flame necessarily. I think he's going to be one of many goalies that might float around the league for years. Yeah, he's good enough. And, you know, a lot of teams have a good enough yeah. starter. And you know there's yeah, like going back like the last 15 years like there's only been maybe 10 goalies that like since 2004 that have been a top tier goalie at for any stretch of time yeah and you know if you have one of those and your team is good then hey you're gonna win the stanley cup and you can see that with Los Angeles, Jonathan Quick, for that stretch of time when they were actually, they won the two cups, was playing at that upper end level. And then he fell off and is bad. But, you know, it. it yeah, usually... I, I personally think Riddick is good enough if our defense is doing their job. But in times like this where, you know, our defense isn't up to snuff, Riddick isn't going to save us, you know, and win us games like Kippersoft could. He's kind of. He's a good goalie, he's good enough, but he needs a strong defense to work with him for him to do his magic as well. Yeah. And it's sort and of like already Cam... seen some chinks in the armor, like his stick handling. Yeah. Well, like, uh, you look at Cam Talbot when he was with the Oilers when they made the playoffs that one year. Like, the Oilers really had no business making the playoffs that year. If it wasn't for Talbot basically standing on his head every game. And... You know, he was the reason why they made the playoffs that one year. 
And it's frustrating because, like, this team... Like, they seem to have little tiny problems everywhere. And in on the individual level, those problems aren't insurmountable. It's just that, like, for right now, what's happening this year is all of them are combining to basically screw the team. <laughs> and it's just death by a thousand cuts right now. And it's... <sighs> They just have to continue to work on all of those little things because the bones of the team, there are enough parts that are doing well and are good enough that they should be better than this. It's just, yeah. And I, and I don't want people to think I'm saying we should trade Riddick or get rid of Riddick, but I think that we have to be honest in what we have in the asset. And he's a good enough goalie, but I think he needs a, you know, a good defensive uh, group in front of him. Yep. We have some fan questions to answer this week. Should we jump right into those, Matt? Definitely. Um, we had a question last week that we didn't get to. We asked it after we started recording, and that was from Nathan Bannerman on Facebook. He asked us uh, about swapping the coaches, which we've already discussed. And then he, he said um, they really didn't make any moves in the offseason. Does Tree pull the trigger on a major trade? If so, who goes and who comes back in return? We talked a little bit about that last week. Don't you know? We don't want to say here that if there's the right deal, they'll make a move. But I, I, I personally, as we've talked about, don't think there's many major moves to be made. Like I think when I'm thinking a major move, I'm thinking you're moving Monahan or uh, Goudreau or Lindholm or, Kuch- or the Hannafin or Hamilton Hannafin trade, like something yeah, or big Brody, on that like, scale. You know, and I don't see that. Well, but but even those those are not major hockey trades because you'd be getting draft picks back if you want to look at that. Yeah. So I think if you're looking to do sort of a major, tra- I think if you're going to trade one of our guys mid season, you're doing it because you want NHL pieces back. All right. If you want to do them for draft picks, you do it either at the deadline or in at the draft. Yeah. And outside of a team like we talked about with Buffalo, I can't really see a team who would want to do those deals and would have the cap to do it. I really think if you want to make a big deal, you would have to make a bad deal first. You'd have to do something like sell for leak for pennies on the dollar, just to free up cap room. And then you could go chase a big fish. But the question is, who's the trade partner? Yeah, I know. And like the only, like there's not really a lot of trades that make sense out there. And like, it it really is tough like even like uh how i mentioned kyle turris like that would be like lucic plus something for turris and like turris hasn't played very well and he has four years and six and change on his contract left and you know that would basically be the only way that that would work and like there's just no easy solution right at this point in time like you know like if usually like when a team is trading the best player in the trade like say we dealt Gaudreau we're going to get less in return than what Gaudreau would bring to this team or less right now yeah and that's why those trades tend to be difficult to make because Like, the Hamilton trade, for an example, like, that one was fine right from the get-go because Hannafin, like, Hamilton wasn't very good defensively, and and he still isn't, but uh, Hannafin was projectable enough to be adequate enough offensively to replace Hamilton's offense while being better defensively and younger, and so... Even that trade, like, you could clearly see that, like, Hannafin should be, at a minimum, close enough to being as good as Hamilton. So, you don't have to really worry about losing on that aspect. And then, you know, the rest of the trade for Lindholm is, you know, that's just gravy. But, you know, you're not going to get trades like that, like, for Gaudreau. Like, it's... We're going to get probably a a second line guy in a draft pick and like well okay so so even looking at that then let's look at teams that could let's say afford take on five million dollars let's say that the difference is if you're looking at a or even three million dollars like you've got you know 
a second line guy like Connor Sheary type salary. So we've got Montreal, who's got 5.75 left. I don't think Montreal is the team you do a deal with if you want a forward. No. Because um, their team kind of is just there. Like, I don't like Montreal very much. They're, it's, yeah. Ottawa's they're, got money, but they're not going to want to take on NHL players. They're trying to rebuild. They're going to want to take on draft picks. Mm-hmm. Colorado's got $5 million, but you're not doing a deal with Colorado. Yeah, because um, they're looking to add anyway. Uh, just outright. They're not Win- well, looking to take things away from their team. The Winnipeg Jets have about $5 million, but again, I don't know what... I think Winnipeg's got a lot of young assets they're going to overvalue, and I don't think you're going to get anything done there. I don't even know that they would want to take on a big NHL contract like Goudreau's. Yeah. Um, so then we look... We've got the Columbus Blue Jackets have $8 million. I'm not really sure what pieces I'd want from Columbus. And they're kind of rebuilding as well, so they, they don't really have an incentive to add a guy who's a free agent in two years. Well, that's it. And they would rather sell some of the veterans they have left and uh, pick up some draft picks. New Jersey, if you're going to do that, you do the Taylor Hall deal. Yeah. Um, the Islanders, they're rolling. I don't think they want to make a trade right now. No. And then the LA Kings. And again, what do you get back from the Kings? And yeah, they don't really, they're in a rebuild themselves. So they, a guy like Gaudreau doesn't really help them much. So looking at that then, I mean, we look at teams like, you know, the, the Bruins, the Sabres, the Panthers, who you could do deals with, you know, the stars, the wild, but you would have to trade like contract for like contract. And I just, I don't know that helps us. I don't think this is a situation that we can trade our way out of. No, and that's why, like, um, last week I was mentioning that the Flames, like, if they do deals, just keep the main guys, Lindholm, Kachuk, Monaghan, Goudreau, and the four young defensemen, and, you know, trade off other parts if you're going to make deals just because of the fact that you're not going to get the correct value now, and it's tough because of the cap crunch that everybody's going through to make trades that even work period like i just i don't think you trade your way out of this to become successful so if we're going to start trading those pieces to do sort of a, a retool like you mentioned i think you just have to wait till the deadline and do it then yeah or you know if the, somebody offers you the correct price for one of the parts that you're willing to deal off then you just take it earlier but well, that's always the case, right? We don't have to say that anymore. If you no GM says, "Wow, I got the right price for something," I'm not going to take it. Like that's that's GM 101, right? But the question is, what is that price? Is what he's asking. Yeah. So, it just a uh, like uh, the Flames, if they continue to be mediocre through the middle of December, then I think things start going on the trade off the secondary parts of the team. So Nathan, and you're you're not, saying here uh, you want to make a move. Let us know what move you want to make or what you think you'd want to see here because I think Matt and I agree there's really no moves to be made. Yeah, at least during the season. Like if that was to happen, it would be at the draft, if anything. Yeah, or, but it, or or if the Flames were to say trade Goudreau, it would have to be an extreme massive overpayment by the other team where you're like, yeah, okay, thanks for everything. And, you know, but the, that those things never happen, really, so. And, you know, I mean, we as Flames fans look at this and say six-game losing streak. They're doing terrible. Let's, you know, trade our way out of this. Once you start making the trades you've talked about this week or last week, you're really calling an end to your season. Like, you're not going to make these things and then say, oh, we're still a playoff team. Like, you know, I think once you're out – why make the trade now? Just wait for the deadline when you're going to get teams to overpay for your veterans. That's the, I think the best way to go and start it there, finish the draft. But I just don't think that you trade Goudreau or you make a big trade and we bring in Taylor Hall and he, we, you know, he's not going to carry us the Stanley cup. Like right now it's more than just, if we had one player that wasn't performing well, maybe, but with the number of players we have that just aren't performing, you can't trade the whole team mid season. No, I mean, and to me, the only guys that are looking good out there are Lindholm, Monaghan, Mongepani, Giordano, and Hamannick, and Anderson. So, you know, like, you, you can't trade everybody else. 
No, and that's the reason why the Flames are doing as badly as they are, is that they only have, like, half of the team playing well, and the other half are invisible or a clear detriment to the team. I also think if you're a team out there trying to make a trade, you're probably going to wait until Toronto gets healthy because they're going to have to shed some salary to get under cap, and I think you'll be able to get better players than Calgary might be offering for cheaper. True. True. So, you know, again, we've got to find the right dance partner. And Nathan, if you know, if you can think of a dance partner, let us know. But I think right now there's no dance partner to make a trade with. We can't just drop a guy on their doorstep and say, here's this guy. Uh, We're just going to go to the rink and pick three of those guys. Okay. Like, you know, you need the partner. And outside of Buffalo, I don't know who the partner is. Yeah. Well, we had another question this week from Amy Lemieux on Facebook. Amy says, uh, thoughts on Jankowski's role on the team and why Peters is scratched for a leak for multiple games while Jankowski continues to play. I thought that's a good question from Amy. You and I have uh, talked a lot about how Jankowski is not looking good this year. I'll start with this. I think Froelich has, for whatever reason, got in the bad book of the coach. I think Froelich probably doesn't want to be here. There were some trade rumors last year that he was done. And I think that with Janko being a young player, they want to see if they can get him going. Because at $1.675 million, if you can get him going, he's of great value to you. I think that we know what we have in Froelich. You can sit him down. He's out of here at the end of the year. I think you have less to lose in sort of the development cycle sitting for a leak than you do Janko. What are your thoughts, man? Well, to add on to that, for a leak, a winger, and the Flames have plenty of wingers organizationally, where Jankowski being a center, we don't really have anybody else. We're short on right wingers, though, and for a leak's a right winger. Yeah, but you can kind of throw a left winger on that side like Manjapani has at times, and he's a left winger. You can do that a lot easier than the center, and like only Dylan Dubé really can play center, and he's not experienced as a pro to be a center yet. So it's one of those where they kind of have to, even if, like, in terms of raw play, I think that Jankowski has been less good than for Leak, but... You know, just for the position he plays, he is their top penalty killer, and the Flames have had one of the better penalty kills. So even though he's struggled offensively, for sure, the Flames' penalty kill has been good, and Jankowski has been a pivotal part of that. And, yeah, it it is what it is. Like, it, you know, both these guys are secondary parts on this team, and... If Jankowski, like, he looked a lot better in the Pittsburgh game. I think that was his best Everybody game. Everybody looked in better years. in the Pittsburgh game. Yeah, but I think that was his best game in, like, two years. And so, if Jankowski can light a fire under himself to get going, then I think that he'll both start to capitalize on those chances and, you know, contribute to this team instead of just being there. And that's part of the problem with Jankowski is that he's a very gentlemanly-like person, and he's passive in how he plays. And I think he has to learn some of that anger and intensity to, like, just show some emotion. And, like, today when I was watching the game, like, they actually showed him getting ticked off at himself for not scoring. And, like, I think that's the first time I've ever seen him show emotion on the bench. And, like, he needs to have that commitment emotionally to the game in order to take his game to that next level. And He's the tallest guy on the team, six foot four, two twelve. I think that the team's hoping that they can harness something out of that guy. As much as we haven't seen a lot from Jankowski, I wouldn't say that he's been a detriment to the team at this point. I think... Neither would I with Froelich, but as a fourth-line center, I think we're getting out of Jankowski what we expect from a fourth-line center. Yeah, it's just uh, I think everybody's expectations were that he's more of a third-line center, maybe pushing for a second-line spot, possibly. And yeah, we just haven't seen that thus far this year. And we've seen the coach. I mean, we've seen him elevate Mangiapane up the lineup. There's a guy who didn't play all last season. When he did, he was in the bottom six. 
You know, he, he didn't even have a contract coming into the season. So I think that Peters is trying to put young guys in the lineup. We've seen him do that with uh, Anderson, Shillington. I think that's part of the reason Janko's been here. I think the team wants to know what they've got in him. And also, it's probably partly if he plays, you can showcase him. And if there's something you can put him in a deal, like the rumored Froelich and Janko for Zucker deal, you'd rather have people see him, do, see him playing so that you could do that. Yeah, because it's always bad press of, oh, somebody was a healthy scratch. Cause well, the, that, like, but in this case, Fro Leak's the healthy scratch. Yeah, but Fro Leak's an expiring contract and a known asset, so yeah. you know what you're getting with him. And where Jankowski, you know, it... Because, like, the thing is that general managers do not watch every game that every team plays, and so... No, but that's why they have pro scouts. No, I know, but, you know, they also look at, like, how he played at times last year and the Flames' penalty kill and all that kind of stuff and see that, well, those are the aspects of his game. Like, yeah, the offense is there, but, you know, for his other parts of his job, he's doing a good job. So, you know, it, it's it's just like uh, when Sutter acquired uh, Alish Kotalik back in the day. Uh, Kotalik scored a one nice goal on the power play against the flames. Uh, and then like a couple of weeks later, he was on the team and I don't think that Sutter had watched too much of Froley cause he did score a really nice goal, but, uh, yeah, he didn't, I don't think he saw too much of how Kotalik played. <laughs> Otherwise we would not never have gone through that experience, but I think you're doing more harm than good by sitting Janko out at this point. If he's not a detriment to the team, I think you just keep him rolling. You make him earn his way up the lineup and making him the you know fourth line center. It's not hurting us, but at least he's out there. He's getting the reps and he's playing. And I think right now that's the best thing you can do for him. Yeah, and if he turns it around, then that's awesome. And you know, uh, if he can resume being that like 15 goal ish guy. Like, I don't think he'll get that high, even if he does rebound this year. But, you know, more that pace of play than, you know, he's more than adequate being on the team. And, yeah, we'll see. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if he's not here in the off season. But I think for this year, he's an asset and you've got to play him as such. And like you said, we've got Froelich, who's sort of a known asset. Um, I just, and he's developed as much as he's going to. I think right now the best thing you can do for for Janko is just get him the reps. And even though they're giving him the reps, you know, low in the lineup, he's still out there. He's still playing. He's still doing those things he needs to do. Yeah. And to his credit, you know, the penalty kill has looked good this year and he has been the number one penalty killer on the team. So like he's usually the first guy out there. And with Dubé playing on the third line, I think once we see Sam Bennett out or back in the lineup, eventually, um, that might be the the question of what happens with Janko then. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that pretty much wraps up everything we've got to talk about with the Calgary Flames this week. You ready to look ahead and do some predictions? Hopefully, we see some wins. Hopefully. Well, last week I thought we'd win against Colorado and lose everything on the road. I was wrong. You were a little too pessimistic. You thought we'd lose all four, um, and we lost one and got a point in one. So um, this week we've got two games. The Calgary Flames on Wednesday take on the Buffalo Sabres in Buffalo. Then they get a couple of games off and they're back in their own beds on Saturday to take on the Ottawa Senators for a 5 p.m. start time. That's an early Saturday game, which we usually don't see. And then after that, they've got four days off. So only two, two games until we talk again. Um, I'm going to be bold, Matt. I'm going to say that we win both. And I'll be pessimistic and say they lose both. Do you think we see Riddick in both? I think they'll split. Which one do you think we'll see Talbot in? Uh, Probably the Ottawa game. That's what I'm thinking too. I think they're going to play Riddick in both because there's some, um, there's some time there. They got two days, but I think you can beat Buffalo because Buffalo's down on their luck right now. I feel the two teams are going the the opposite direction. Calgary's on their way up. The the main reason why I'm concerned about the Buffalo game is that they've only won there once since 1996. It's almost as bad as the Honda Center. 
for the Flames. Well, the new bit. Honda Center is the T-Mobile Arena. Yeah. We've yet to win in Vegas. Yeah. So, I just, I don't know. Uh, like, the, it's one of those things. Like, each year they should beat Buffalo. But they just play so bad against them. And Buffalo plays so bad that, like, usually the games in Buffalo are, like, the single worst games each year to just watch and get through. Because it's like the Flames, Buffalo's bad, and let's play down to their level. And <laughs> it's just... and you think we're going to play down to Ottawa too? Well, Ottawa's actually been good lately. And they've, they've been on a little bit of a hot streak, actually. Um, they're 7-3 and three in their last 10, and they're right up. You know, they've, they've closed the gap on some of the teams that are ahead of them. So, um, you know, we'll see. I... Uh, that one, uh, if they're going to win a game this week, I, I would be more likely to think it would be the Ottawa game. But, you know, I'm going with b two losses just because I think that the fact that they weren't rewarded with the win today, I think, might cause them to, you know, regress in their game. See, and I'm hoping it's going to be the opposite. I hope they're going to look at that game against uh, the Penguins and say, you know what, guys, we did well, we played well. Let's build on that and let's be hungry because we didn't get the win and let's go out and find that win. Well, I'm hoping you're right. We'll find out, Matt. That's uh, all we've got. It's kind of nice to only have two games. It means that this schedule is slowing down a little bit. Yeah, it's nice. And mm -hmm. like, especially because in December, like they're playing basically every other day and uh, against a lot of good opponents. And it, a lot of tough games for the Flames up until Christmas, so they have to enjoy the little bit of a break between now and the 5th, because um, they have like 10, 11 days where they only play two two games, so, you know, it's a nice little bit of a break for them, and hopefully they'll be ready, because it's going to come fast and furious after that. We'll profile their December schedule when we chat next week. Um, but, yeah, let's enjoy these two games. Remember, they're both 5 p.m. starts, so some early games for us this week. Could be good or bad for you if you're on your way home from work on Wednesday. And um, if you're going to the Dome Saturday, make sure you get there a little bit early because otherwise you'll get there just as the game's ending, which might actually be the only part of the game to see based on how the Flames have been playing. Just show up at <laughs> 7, you'll see the best part of the game. Yeah. Oh. They should hey they didn't show up for the first two periods and neither did i <laughs> the flame show almost just set the clock in the dressing room ahead two hours it's like all right it's seven o'clock time to go play boys yep <laughs> or on a normal night okay it's nine o'clock let's get let's get going yep i know well, they Matt, should have like a little uh score clock in their uh dressing room that like shows them down to nothing before the game even starts and say okay guys we gotta get you know come back <laughs> Well, I wonder if you could just, like, I wonder if there's any rules where you can spot the team two periods. Yeah. Like, can you forfeit a period? Because they could just do that. All right, we we forfeited the period one nothing, and, uh, you know, now we'll do the second one, and we'll come out and meet you in the third. Yeah. Or, you know, those little kids, they get on the ice for the first couple, just put those guys out there. Yep. Um, they always put them <laughs> on the intermission, and then we can come out and play in the third, and we do well. <laughs> Well, with that, we'll hope that the Flames are doing better and don't need to do that. Hopefully they can play two complete games. I'd even go for 40 minutes at this point, but I'm hoping that the Flames are on the turnaround and we will find out this week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.